My talk today is really about the future and I don't know what the future holds in store. Let's admit that for a start. But I am concerned to try to anticipate some of the developments in the future in disaster risk reduction and related topics. But I think we are at a point in history where things are going to change. We need to prepare for a world in which we must confront realities that are changing fast, that are dynamic, and that are extremely challenging. In disaster risk reduction, our stock in trade is human misery. Well, obviously, we want to reduce it. But in so doing, we need to concentrate not merely on disasters, but on the context of disasters. And we need to look at what disasters are related to, what is the general problem that we have to understand and think of solutions for. There are disturbing trends in the world, and I thank the uh, artist, cartoonist Banksy for the, uh, the picture here. When disaster occurs, 15 years ago I put together this diagram, I think it is possibly still valid. And there is a relationship between capital and labour in this, and we need to think more about what it is and what its implications are. Capital reforms after disaster quicker than labour does. Capital adapts to disaster quicker than labour does, and better than labour does. Capital, in many respects, has the upper hand over labour. Capital even displaces labour. Now that may lead us to think about what the relationship is between disasters and disaster recovery, reduction and migration. So that's what I want to devote these moments to, this talk to. Another question that perhaps we should ask ourselves is, how does all of this work in a time of austerity? What is the relationship between debt and democracy? For years we have been saying that in disaster relief, disaster reduction, we need more democracy. We need transparency. We need governance. We need participation. But do we talk about debt? Do we talk about enthrallment? Do we talk about the redistribution of resources towards those who have more and away from those who have less? That is a good question. So there are complex relationships there. I don't pretend to understand them well, but I do think we should devote more attention to them. So in many respects, capital is winning against labour, but will the tide turn? Will there be changes? Will there be the revival of the strength of labour in this business? In January, I was in Geneva at the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction Conference on Applying Science to Disaster Reduction. We talked about how science can be used to reduce the risk and the impact of disasters. In the middle of the conference, the Oxfam report was published on world poverty that stated that the number of people who own half of the world's wealth has reduced in the last two years from 78 to 62, and 7.6 trillion US dollars of that wealth are stashed away in 78 tax havens. In point of fact, one in six properties in central London is owned by a company in a tax haven and is probably empty. So what is the role of capital against labour in this process of trying to reduce disaster? Are we looking at the wrong things? And in point of fact, depending on who you are, you might argue that disasters have benefit rather than merely being detrimental businesses. They consolidate power structures. 
Now that usually is not good for most of us, but it is very good for some of us. They augment profits and they redistribute wealth, usually in a not very equitable way. They allow the introduction of repressive measures. There are good examples of this from tsunamis and earthquakes in Sumatra, Indonesia, in the 2000s. And they permit forms of gratuitous social engineering. They allow society to be changed. And to read up on that, you can perhaps read Naomi Klein and others who've written about disaster capitalism and uh, shock therapy in capitalism related to disasters. Capital is a resource, obviously, for mitigation and recovery. It is necessary. We need the riches, the wealth of the world to recover from disaster and reduce the risk. It is not necessarily harmed by disaster. New Zealand was reputed to have lost 10% of its gross domestic product in the Christchurch earthquakes of 2010-11. But in fact, it suffered no recession as a result. Japan has a recession, but it is certainly not caused by the tsunami, nuclear release, and earthquake of 2011. Indeed, uh, capital can be a stimulus or stimulated by such disasters. And in that respect, because many people do not benefit when disaster occurs, quite the opposite, we have to ask ourselves whether capital safeguards itself or others, its users, its beneficiaries, and who these people might be. And you could also argue that the cheapness and redundancy of labor is a form of disenfranchisement. That is to say, it gives people, or rather, it takes power away from people uh, rather than empowering them. You see this, for example, in the way that emigration is stimulated by disaster in places like Nepal, the Philippines, and Haiti. One reaction to that is the alternative economy. I have to call it that because it is rather complex and it amounts to about 20% of the world economy. Nobody really knows because there are no means of measuring it directly. However, the black economy, for example, there is no doubt that mafias benefit from disaster. The basis of much mafia activity is cement, concrete. Reconstruction, therefore, is enormously important to mafias around the world. It is something that they can benefit from truly enormously, and then they go on to launder and reinvest the money in places like Beijing, Caracas, and, I'm afraid, very much in London. And then there is the grey economy. It was estimated that after the tsunami in Phuket in Thailand, about 70% of the economy there was informal. Now the problem with that is it generates no tax revenues that might contribute to reducing disaster risk. But on the good side, it does keep people alive by providing employment. And in fact, that is the real reason for the existence of mafias in the black economy. They employ people when the state or the regular system does not. What we need to do, however, is to look at the relationship between disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, which will inevitably lead to migration, and displacement as a result of conflict or other causes, which right now is leading to a global crisis in migration. So in that respect, I would like to talk a little bit about migrants, because I had the feeling late last year that we might have passed a threshold where we move from a situation in which migration is not central to the world situation to one in which it is. For 400 years, we have had a concept of sovereignty and belonging and identity 
It is being eroded by globalism. That is not necessarily a bad thing, but it is changing the parameters by which we live. We talk in disaster recovery about geographical inertia, the idea that places are rebuilt in situ. If a disaster damaged Coimbra, it would be rebuilt here. But we assume with this that people also have an inertia and will return to live in such places. Is that any longer quite so true? In Christchurch, 10% of the population left. They will probably not come back. In Japan, after the tsunami, in fact, the tsunami itself accelerated a process of moving to cities such as Fukushima, Sendai and Tokyo that was already underway. Vast amounts of money are being spent on the Sanriku coast of Japan to attract people back there, but this is unlikely to be highly successful. But what is human mobility? Well, it has a variety of sides to it. There are the refugees we see so often on television. There are the so-called economic migrants, many of whom have little choice but to seek employment wherever in the world they can find it, at whatever conditions. There are those who are simply displaced, and there will be more of those as a result of climate change in the future. And there are those who are mere opportunists. Twice in my life I have emigrated, and nobody forced me to, uh, but I had that opportunity and took it. Migration may be voluntary, it may be induced, or it may be forced. Human mobility may be temporary, semi-permanent, or permanent. And the most extreme examples, of course, are those where it results in statelessness. So we are dealing with quite a complex picture, and moreover, one that is evolving dynamically. You could argue that human mobility is a reaction to the sort of global hegemony that has led 62 people to have half of the world's wealth. You could argue also that the proliferation of wars, many of which are proxy wars, you could argue that Syria is a proxy war, East against West, Russia against the Western forces, and the struggle for power in such places, which displaces the populations, is one major cause of human mobility. As is, of course, the globalization of production, where production can be shifted very easily, very rapidly, from one country to another in order better to exploit labor. And if capital is mobile, capital is enormously mobile, it can move in microseconds. No human can do that. But nevertheless, human mobility may well be a reaction to the enormous mobility of capital. Have we passed a threshold? This, by the way, is a pornographic picture. What does it show? People playing golf in Melija, the Spanish enclave in North Africa, whilst others try to get across the 11-kilometer fence around it. But nevertheless, um, Overall, have we passed a threshold in which human mobility is now much more important than it was in the past? We have had moments of upheaval. For example, the invention of spinning and weaving machinery destroyed a cottage industry. In the long term, that is not a bad thing. It enables vastly greater production of cloth, but it certainly worried those who came to smash the machines with hammers in 1815. We now have a very similar position with the development of robotics. Uh, what will that lead to? It certainly changes the disposition of jobs and of income. We don't really know how. So we live in a world in which some of these issues for so long fairly static are now very much under question. It is very strange that in disaster risk reduction, there is no definition of the word welfare. Welfare is what we provide to those who are disadvantaged survivors of disaster, but we do not define it. 
Politically, it is not expedient to define welfare. Politically, it's a bad idea. But the trouble with welfare is that many of the examples of it are not at all welfare, actually. What they are are vote buying. Sometimes these are called forgiveness money, where people who fail to reduce their own risk of disaster are paid back by governments to re-establish their assets where they were and recreate the risk. And why does this happen? Because they are voters and they vote for governments. So we see situations after disaster where the whole idea of welfare is distorted. Now I believe in welfare. I believe it should be given to those who cannot help themselves. But I don't believe that welfare should be distorted to the point where it creates disaster risk. Here's a definition of welfare. It's my definition because I was unable to find a suitable definition in the literature. But beyond this definition, an acceptable standard of assistance to people to enable them to live adequate lives uh, in line with their own abilities to do so. We also need to look at what welfare is not. What happens after disaster in terms of who gets what and what the political connotations are of recovery from disaster in terms of concepts like welfare. There is a parallel, there are several parallels between disaster risk reduction and human mobility. For example, both of these fields are full of myths and misassumptions. The British government, for example, put out, or no, it didn't put out, it commissioned a report on migrants. And the report generally showed that migrants have been highly beneficial to the UK and they do not use up UK resources. They don't have much impact on housing and almost none on the health system. Therefore, the government decided it would not publish the report because the report was the opposite of policy. This makes nonsense of the idea of basing policy on the evidence. But that is often the way things are done in both migration-related issues and in disaster risk reduction. Migration has some parallels with disaster-related evacuation. Informal settlements are common to both uh, examples, and the background picture shows Tacloban in the Philippines and a picture I took of informal settlements on the beach four months after the cyclone. Precarious livelihoods are associated with both disasters and mobility. And I think crises of leadership are common to both. We see in Europe a horrendous crisis of leadership over migration. I don't think we've had much leadership or good leadership over disasters either particularly in those countries where disasters are most common. The leadership in both Britain and Italy has been poor in this respect. So currently, the links between these two fields, particularly academically, are fairly slight, but they may well become much larger in the future, especially as climate change will probably stimulate migration as never before. There are some antecedents. For example, few people remember that after the 1980 earthquake in southern Italy, the Italian government, which owned the national airline, Alitalia, offered many of the peasants of the highlands of Irpinia one-way tickets to Australia, Canada, and other European countries. That was induced migration, perhaps not coerced migration, but induced migration. We find forced migration in the most unexpected places, including after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. It has been studied by Anthony Oliver Smith, a leading anthropologist. Now let's look very briefly at disaster theory. I put some of the international protagonists' uh, photographs there. Uh, one great defect of this is that there are too few women and too many men. We hope in the future that will change. We've had two big bangs in this field. Socially, we have 99 years of history in studying disasters, and two big bangs. The one on the right is obviously 
11th of September 2001, New York City. The one on the left, however, is the ship explosion in Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1917 that led to the first serious study of the social implications of disaster by Samuel Henry Prince. There he is on the left. He was a Catholic priest. He ministered to his parishioners and wrote his PhD thesis at Columbia University on the social implications of disaster. It is downloadable now. Um, likewise, Harlan Burroughs, a big-shouldered, tall, bluff Midwesterner at the University of Chicago, gave the presidential address to the American Association of Geographers in 1923 on human ecology and disasters, and that started another trend, uh, and eventually they, they more or less coalesced. So those are the two works, and both of them are digitally available for free right now. So from the 20s to the 60s, I think floods really dominated the scene. And we really have to thank a Quaker called Gilbert White for having pushed that field forward, advanced it very substantially. And he was the first to propose policies of a much broader approach to flooding, which took into account the organizational and social effects, and latterly even the perception of floods by key stakeholders, such as farmers, residents, and business owners. But the Simon approach was based on, oh, sorry, the, the Whiteian approach was based on the work of Herbert Simon. And it is rather eerie to read what Simon had to say because at the root of this, Simon was suggesting that really, in economic terms, we're all the same animal, and we are not. Firstly, there is a difference often between perception among men and women, and I have to say that women's perception is often more sensible, more rational even. Uh, secondly, there are huge cultural differences in perception that were simply left out of the equation. From the 1970s to the 80s, using Herbert Simon's Homo economicus, the rational man, studies of droughts, earthquakes, tornadoes, floods and so on, went on under the assumption that there were no cultural differences, no cultural implications. That was the age of rationalist human ecology. But like so much rationalism, it wasn't rational. And then we come to the radical critique of Kenneth Hewitt and his colleagues. Five years of study in which they were disappointed and disillusioned with the rationalist approach. And they proposed something different. The orthodox model at the time suggested that physical events act upon human vulnerability to give us the consequences of disaster. The radical critique says sort of the opposite. Human vulnerability is what disasters are about, and physical events are merely a trigger that set off social processes, and that gives us our human consequences. But things are now different, things have moved on. What we actually need is more of a model in which culture and history are incorporated into it in a plexus rather than a chain of influences to give us our human consequences. So we actually need, and we haven't got enough theory for the 21st century in the study of disasters. The world has changed direction since about 1970, plus or minus two or three years. Wealth differentials started to evolve around 1970 towards a huge disparity which continues to increase and is blatantly visible in many of the world's most vulnerable cities. Important fact. We need to reevaluate as a result of consequence of that geographical inertia. This is Tokyo, supposedly the world's most vulnerable city, according to some analyses. But is it? And if so, what the, will the consequences be of the next earthquake, fire, flood, or whatever it is that seriously affects Tokyo? Uh, 
in this respect, there are connections. In 1993, I published a book called Natural Disasters. I couldn't do it again. Disasters may be, but a disaster is a disaster is a disaster. Natural or not, natural is a convenience term in any case. And look at all the influences. For example, with pandemics, it's quite possible that the effects could be extremely profound and greater socio-economic effects than medical ones. Pandemics are at least as much an economic and social problem as they are a medical problem. Um, displacement, terrorism, climate change. How to put all of that together to give us theory for the 21st century is a major, major challenge. And in this, there are also human rights. Now, you probably all know about Pombal's reconstruction of Lisbon. It was a brilliant achievement, but it was achieved by riding roughshod over people's human rights. Anyone who disagreed was executed. Well, that was common at the time, not merely in Portugal, but all over Europe. Nevertheless, we have to think carefully now about this because if you are deprived of human rights, then your ability to confront disaster, risk and disaster impact, is reduced substantially. You lose access to information and ability to act to protect yourself. So, what is going on? Here's a little framework that one could use to anal analyse it. Ideology against culture. Is the ideology benign or malign? Is it good or bad? Is it at the service of the people in general or at the service of particular people in a dictatorial sense? In this, culture is important. But what is culture? Well, when you are born, you inherit culture. There is a Portuguese culture. It is centuries or millennia old. Um, as you grow, you accumulate culture through your life experiences. But the great metamorphosis of culture is technologically driven. The internet, handheld devices, telephones, television, images on a screen. This is having an enormous impact that many would regard as at least as profound as the invention of printing or something like that and a very rapid impact, and it is likely to change our view of disaster, well, it already has profoundly changed our view of disaster, but it will continue to do so into the future, as long as we know. In this respect, symbolism is important. Symbolism is something you can study in a slightly cruder way, back to, for example, the Middle Ages, but we still have symbolism, it's still important, it is still essential to look at the modern parallels of traditional forms of symbolism in disaster. It is not easy to interpret them, but they are there. There is a symbolism in technological culture. There has to be. It is so complex, we have to reduce it to symbols, icons, or whatever. And there is the symbol, uh, symbolism of traditional culture, and they fuse and they melt in this metamorphic process, metamorphosis of culture, very dynamic. And so to conclusions, that's a map of the universe. Don't ask me why, I just like the picture. Um, and that is a work of art in Edinburgh. I hope that the artist is right. Disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation will probably sort of merge. I think they have to. Uh, there are going to be huge changes in populations associated with climate change, and it will be the extremes that drive this. Therefore, the storms, the floods, uh, the extremes of temperature, and hence the disasters. Global mobility, I think, is not going to go away. We're not in a temporary phase in which people start to move from one country to another. We're in a phase of accelerating globalism in which there is a belated response on the part of labor and people, humanity, to the capital-based, technological-based side of it, but there is a response and it is gathering pace. Thirdly, we talk a lot about resilience, but I suspect that the idea 
may disappoint. Whether or not it will be dropped, I don't know. But the trouble with the idea of resilience is we are asking too much of the concept. It's not a bad concept, it's a good concept. But it is a simple concept, and people are starting to suggest that it has miraculous properties. Well, it doesn't. It's simply a simple concept. Third, uh, nextly, fourthly, um, the weight of key concepts, vulnerability is likely to be a more enduring concept and a good basis for much of the theory we need to construct. That is definitely not going to go away. It will probably rise. And we need to develop a strategy practically in which we make disaster risk reduction sustainable. From 2008 it has been clear that it can go backwards, not merely forwards. You can cancel programs, stop the funding, and vulnerability will come back. So sustainable DRR, but also that has to be fitted in to a more sustainable lifestyle generally. If you look at the city of Copenhagen, they are trying to do that there. Variable success. Uh, however, they are at least trying. Uh, they can afford to, of course, but in any case, much of this is purely organisational. <coughs> we need to have the mindset and the organisation to fit the two kinds of sustainability together. Are we talking about disaster risk reduction? Some have suggested instead we're talking about disaster risk creation. Uh, in other words, that we need to stop thinking about how we're going to reduce disasters and start focusing how we're going to stop people <coughs> making disasters. Uh, that is the wisdom that comes out of the other IRDR integrated uh, research on disaster risk uh, based in Beijing. I recently was able, last month in fact, was able to go to Fukushima Daiichi and I managed to reach the uh, red spot there which is about 20 meters away from uh, the reactor number three which is highly radioactive and where they are trying to design robots to pick up the radioactive pieces uh, without frying. Uh, the radiation level outside the bus I was in was the equivalent of about 300 x-rays um, but uh, it was nevertheless fairly safe to visit it. A huge amount is going on there at Fukushima Daiichi, 7,000 people work there. They have their own hotel and their own uh, canteen where they eat local food. Uh, but the Japanese, for all their mistakes, are highly active at trying to uh, clean up and, and rectify the problem here. Um, the trouble is that they've lost a great deal of um, support from their own population as a result of the very bad early response to it. But that was not something that changed the world. It did, not uh, permanently, but temporarily, and it did in a limited way, but it was not a profound change. It had an effect upon the popularity of nuclear power, but perhaps we need something, sadly, that is very much more profound, and I think only an effect on the world economy will lead to substantial changes in how we manage disaster. There is a set of scenarios for the next Tehran earthquake in Iran which give projected death tolls of between 432,000 and 596,000. But even half a million deaths in Iran I don't think will change the way that we deal with disasters because large death tolls in conflict have not done so. So I think only effects on the world economy will um, create profound change. I also don't think that we have to fear things that we've never heard of before and are completely new. Uh, we talk in English about the red herring, something that simply uh, is a waste of time, meaningless. I don't think we have black swans. The whole idea of the black swan is fine in economics, but not in disaster risk reduction. The black swan is the idea that um, suddenly, through going to Australia, you discover completely unexpectedly that not all swans are white. And now let's apply that to other things in society. Well, I don't think that we are going to be confronted by things, and I think we never have been confronted by things that are completely unexpected, 
in disaster risk reduction. So I conclude with three axioms. Firstly, DRR is about vulnerability, reducing it and supplanting it with development. So actually is migration, human mobility. Secondly, well, actually here's an illustration of that. The problem we have with it is that we are constantly at the same time creating and reducing disaster risk. We have a dialectic between the two factors. At the top of the diagram, how we perceive that is the wild card. This is the way of saying um, it can go either way, depending on whether the perception is uh, good or bad, whether the perception leads us to reduce or increase risk, to create disaster or to reduce it. The second axiom is that climate change adaptation is about adapting to vulnerability in the same way that disaster risk reduction is. We all have to adapt to vulnerability. Climate change will be a source of mobility and therefore so will disaster. And this is simply a way of saying in three axioms that these fields are somehow connected. But in many ways I have to leave it to people like you to find out how they are connected. It's going to take a long time and a lot of effort. But we have to do it. I've given you a rather negative view of society. We could call it a Pandora's box theory of disasters. Pandora's box was actually a Victorian invention of the 19th century. In ancient history it was a jar, an amphora, not a box. But Pandora let the top off and out came all of the world's ills, but at the bottom, the last thing to come out was hope. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, one piece of blatant self-publicity. In two weeks' time, my next book comes out, and it's called How to Write an Emergency Plan, published on the 26th of May. Um, this and other presentations are on SlideShare, can be downloaded. Thank you for listening.